Hello, welcome to this video. This video is part five of my history of progressive rock in 60 albums. And we're around about the halfway point. We've got to 1990, all right? Um, so just to catch up on the video, first video, I um, defined what progressive rock was, is, so I could determine whether I am talking about the right stuff. And then we looked at the foundational albums of the 1960s. You know, starting with uh, Frank Zappa's Free Cat and moving up towards In the Court of the Kings and Crim. King, King, Crimson King by King Crimson. We then looked at the Golden Age in the 1970s in part three. And uh, I tried to make the argument that prog was as strong by the end of the 70s as it was at the beginning. Uh, but it has changed. Uh, and we see the ideas that progressive rock has innovated then moving out to the, into the 1980s. And, and you can see progressive rock ideas in the new wave of British heavy metal, and thrash metal, and prog metal. We see in in pop music with artists like Kate Bush and um, uh, uh, Talk Talk. We see it in, in avant-garde rock bands like Cardiacs. We see it in different places throughout the 80s. Um, and we really ended on the sort of development of progressive metal and how important that be, it will be. And then the album I looked at 1989, where I finished that video, was Dream Theatre and how important Dream Theatre is going to be as a sort of touchstone for prog going forward right up until now. Um, we then talked about the sort of revolution that happens at the end of the 1980s where music had become quite a part of the establishment of pop music had. Um, and then that all gets upturned by quite revolutionary music forms like hip hop, grunge, and the dance music, electronic music. Okay, and that's where we're at in 1980. So what have I got at 1990, all right? The album I'm going to have to represent 1990 is Passion and Warfare by Steve Vai. This is an out and out progressive rock album. It's a conceptual album, all the tracks, blend into one another uh, in, a, in a suite of virtually instrumental recordings that um, cover Vi's life really up until that point. It's dripping with instrumental virtu virtuosity. It's pushing the envelope technically of what was capable in the record studio at that time. It brings in heavy metal, it brings in jazz fusion, progressive rock, you know, um, all sorts of different forms. It's an out and out progressive rock album. Steve Vi, releases this album in 1990, it sells a million copies, right? Prog, all the way through this history, has continually produced million selling albums. It's, it's not a form that exists in the early 70s and then dies. In 1990, we have an album like Passion and Warfare, which is really representing a whole genre of music, which is huge at the time, which is the sort of guitar shred End of heavy metal, you know, uh, Joe Satriani, um, Racer X, Cacophony, Jason Becker. Um, it, these albums are selling and these guitarists are then turning up and bringing this sort of instrumental virtuosity into various rock bands that they are working in at the time. I'm thinking like Marty Freeman in Megadeth. Um, this phenomenon, which is really going to then so fuse itself into progressive metal is at its peak in 1990 with Passion and Warfare by Steve Vai. Right? Um, but by 1990, we see the emergence of rap metal, like the this sort of whole Fishbone, Red Hot Chili Peppers thing, which is subfused with progness, especially bands like Fishbone. Uh, we also are going to see the um, grunge. And although Nirvana Yes, influenced by King Crimson's Red. But bands like Soundgarden, with the odd time signatures, definitely have got an influence of prog, and grunge is going to come in. So rock music changes, and pretty soon, the sort of rock music that Steve Vai's peddling suddenly seems out of date. Um, off the back of this change in heavy rock music, we not only get progressive metal, but we get an undercurrent of very proggy, avant-garde rock music. Um, I touched on this in the 80s when I talked about Cardiacs, and the album I've got from 1991, which again is an out-and-out -out prog album, 
is Mr. Bungle's debut album. Now, Mr. Bungle is a band fronted by Mike Patton from Faith No More. Faith No More are a product of this sort of post-grunge era, although Faith No More have been making albums from 1985, which are pushing the envelope. Um, when Patton joins, it's, they go up a gear, uh, but Patton also belongs to this avant-garde, sort of free jazz, um, Arabian disco, heavy metal, thrash metal prog band called Mr. Bungle. Mr. Bungle needs to be on the list of any any uh, great prog albums. So I've got it there at, num at 1991. And that is representing for me the influences that are coming from rock music at that time. And it's so wide and I'm trying to discuss them. Um, if you haven't heard that Mr. Bungle album, um, check it out. Uh, they follow that up with Disco Volante, which even takes these ideas further out. And then there's a third album called California, where they sort of actually take the Mr. Bungle ideas and bring them down. It's sort of almost like a John Barry esque sort of song format. You know, there are three incredible progressive rock albums there for Mr. Bungle. Now, it's not an obvious band that we would mention as a prog band, but it is out and out prog. And I've got it on the list. So um, we're going to see as we go forward that throughout the 90s after the this sort of revolution of visceral music forms emerging which would be the hip-hop going from sort of like, like a, almost like a comedy form of music to very serious political form of music with with you know public enemy and nwa and you know ice t hip-hop is suddenly a, a, an art form and it starts to progress and by the early 90s we have you know, um, artists like Michelle Endegacello and uh, Brand Nubian and um, I can't remember the one I was with, the one that did the uh, Blowout Comb, what band was that? But hip hop suddenly is, is it at its most artistic peak, it's at its most progressive in the early 90s. Dance music, house music has, has begat techno, which has begat jungle which has begat drum and bass and trip hop and is moving towards an, 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 a, being an art form in itself and that's progressing all these forms are progressing you know grunge has turned into you know sort of a lot of post grunge bands and funk metal bands and there's bands like fishbone um suicidal tendencies primus mr bungle we've got all this sort of prog stuff going there so prog is in all sorts of different places by this 1991 but also what's interesting is we start to see the emergence and i think this really comes from the neo prog bands that emerged in the 1980s of a sort of new era of prog where we see more and more bands committed to the influence of 70s progressive rock bands and i think when we talk about progressive rock and probably a lot of the people who watch this channel they are fans of this aspect of progressive rock, which is modern bands really um, emulating and mining the influences from the 70s progressive rock bands. Um, in 1992, I'm going to put forth an album by Echo Lynn, which is the last album before they signed to Sony, mainstream label, which is called Suffocating the Bloom. Now, Echo Lynn, are an example for me of a really high quality band that are not pushing the boundaries. They're not progressive in that sense, but they take the influences from classic progressive rock bands, update them, use modern production methods, you, you know, shape it up from a, a modern progressive rock audience and present a great album. And I think Echo Lynn are one of the first post neo prog bands to do this really successfully. They absolutely, it's a brilliant album, Suffocating the Bloom. Um, and they open the door to literally thousands and thousands of bands out there now that are doing this. And the thing that supports this is by the 1980s, it's possible to make your own CD. Um, and it's 1993, I have Ever by IQ. I could have put Marillion on at this point. A lot of these neo-prog bands, they've developed a fan base throughout the um, 1980s. If we take IQ, they have basically made homemade prog albums like um, Tales from the Lush Actics uh, in 1983. 
Then they've signed a major la label deal. Now, IQ's case, they actually they draw themselves in and they make something which is between a pop and a prog, a prog -a albums. They make a Nomzamo and then I Sitting Comfortably. And then um, after losing their major deal, they reconvene and they, they make, which, I, which is probably, I think, their greatest album, which is ever in 1993 with their own label capturing their own audience. Marillion do the same thing. They are pioneers of bands that self-release. Um, now, it's quite funny. Uh, someone cracked a joke. I think it was Matt Stevens from the prog band Fears of the Dead. You know, when the Porcupine Tree did that gig in London the other day, he said, we have a potential problem because if, if, if any networks go down, all the computer guys are at that gig, <laughs> right? Um, prog bands contain people with the expertise to set their own labels, record themselves, self-release. Prog bands in the 90s start to pioneer this. Marillion and IQ pioneer this. And it enables so many bands to create a career. Self-releasing is what we in the prog world call the weekend warriors. You know, um, well-to-do middle-class gentlemen with some money in their pocket and the expertise of know how to make an album, they can go into record studio and record something that sounds like Pink Floyd or Genesis and stick it out and the labels are there and there's, there is an audience there for that. Echo Lin are that. They're not neo-prog, they're post-neo-prog. They're neo-neo-prog. And all these bands that come in after this, like Anathema and Riverside and all these albums, like bands I never talk about on this channel because I never listen to them because when I put them on, it just sounds like a regurgitation of some prong from the past with all the rough edges taken off you know that is something that emerges here and as we go forward i'm going to actually try and pull some of the stuff out of that which is great for this list but this is one of the reasons why i don't talk about modern prog because i'm going to have to then go and listen to some of these albums sorry about my chair squeaking people have been moaning about my squeaky chair it's freezing here so i'm having to move around it's a very cold day today i've switched my heater off i had the heater on on the last one there'll be a noise all the way through it. i know everyone will moan about that anyway so 1993 ever iq and it's there for a reason at the same token all these music forms that have emerged in the early 90s visceral music forms that have really come out of grunge hip-hop and electronic dance music right um what's interesting here in the uk especially with dance music that that it, it then moves into this whole new age traveler movement which is very hippified and very proggy right the whole new age traveler movement which is a completely different reaction to dance music than which is what was called rave culture here in the uk and they just get so proggy and some suddenly the big hero of this movement is Steve Hillage and his System 7 and everything. You've got the orb coming out sounding like gong and they're going to number one with 20 minute long epics. And prog for me suddenly emerges in a different place. Now the prog world never talks about this. But here, the next few albums I've got, I'm going to bring up some albums from the 90s now that I think is where the cutting edge prog was. So the first album I've got from 1994 is protection by Massive Attack. Massive Attack are like a post hip hop electronic rave band. They're a mellow band. Um, they're pushing their technology. Um, I don't think that protection is that proggy an album, but I think any prog fan listening to it would, would understand the influence of prog on this album in, in that it's a progression from all these music forms that had gone before but protection in 94 opened up a door for a sort of um album listening audience that were, were going to sit down and listen to albums that were influenced by rave and hip-hop and rap and electronica and i'm thinking of the emergence of people like ortecra and aphex twin this is prog all this comes out and for me this is all personified by protection by Massive Attack. You know, I bought that album in 1994 and it was like opening a door to all this stuff. And although this album is not that proggy, for me it represents another type of progressive rock. We're opening that door. So for 1995, I have by Goldie, 
timeless and timeless for me is an out and out progressive rock um, album with conceptual continuity with a whole 20 minute side long epic now yeah this is uh, jungle and electronica but it's still prog um, apparently um, Goldie was inspired to do this by going on holiday and listening to um, a Pat Metheny album which one would it have been it would have been the album with Third Wind on what's that one called can't remember um but for me timeless by goldie is an out and out prog album now i know the prog fans that are watching this at this point i'm losing them i was i i've done really well so far we'd had you know echo lynn and then iq you know but i'm trying to say these two things are there there's the establishment of this prog world which we all know what we're talking about with the literally ten thousand artists out there all making generic prog i call it generic prog and then we have the door opened by this sort of little revolution that happened in music in the early 90s where all these other artists are making extremely proggy albums uh, protection 94 by massive attack and then you know timeless by goldie 1995 i could have had ronnie size life forms in here in 1996 i'm going to put forth um feed me weird things which is the first album by square pusher this is about as prog as it gets, all right? It's about as prog as it gets. Um, Square Pusher is a virtuoso bass player in the sort of jazz fusion tradition that um, in the mid nineties influenced by, you know, dance music um, techniques, got himself a secret so in a drum machine, a sampler. You know, there's no computer used on this album. It's quite astonishing and makes some of the most densest complex music ever made in mainstream rock and roll history, I would say, you know. So um, this album is just utterly prog. The album that follows it, Hard Normal, Normal Daddy, and then Music is Rotted One Note, these are progressive rock albums. And now nobody wants to hear this, but this is where prog is in the 90s. I don't want to go trawling through all these albums by, I don't know, anathema or whatever it is to me that's not prog this is where the prog is is in the 90s and we have to draw uh, uh, attention to it um these you know massive attack goldie ronnie size aphex twin or tecra square pusher these having an influence and they have an influence on one of the big mainstream rock bands of the 90s which is uh, um radiohead and in 1997 we see the release of OK Computer. This reaches the top of the charts of all the great, the lists of greatest albums ever made. I can remember um, Q Magazine bringing out a list of the greatest albums ever made and they put that at the top and it only just come out. I think it shocked everybody because it's like the dark side of the moon of the 90s. In other words, it's out and out prog. And the thing is, it's that's basically grunge mixed with this electronic sort of square pusher massive attack you put those two things together and you get okay computer it's one of the biggest albums in history so here we have how many millions of copies of albums that sold it's an out and out prog album it does everything that prog is supposed to do and here we have in 97 prog is still stood there still able to punch everybody in the face with a huge commercial album that does all the thing that prog does this is a this is something that goes how long can this go on for 1998 I've pulled out TNT by Tortoise. Now, Tortoise are this new wave of sort of jazz fusion groups that really have go back in their tradition to Soft Machine. Um, and what these are, rather than being like a jazz quartet, which is individuals playing music with a mastermind composer at the front of it, like the Pat Metheny group or the Bill Evans group or whatever, what we have emerging here is, is groups that have a name and they operate like um, a rock band. Um, Tortoise are going to be followed up by uh, bands like uh, um, EST and um, The Bad Plus. And I think this lies on the fringes of prog and has influenced prog a lot. Um, and so that's what I've got for 1998. And 1999, the final um, album that I'm going to finish this decade with is Calculating Infinity by Dillinger Escape Plan. This is where prog metal, thrash metal and punk all come together in a highly 
virtuoso uh, music form, which is then going to be got, you know, like deathcore, gent, math rock, and all those forms of music that have really, for me, have come out of progressive metal, which are, are going to love it or hate it, keep prog alive up until this very day. You know, it's 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 the music that young musicians discover when they want to know how to play hard music. It's the genesis and the yes and the rush of of today's musicians, and um, we will see that emerging as I get onto the the next list where I'm going to look at the 2000 and from 2000 to 2010. And this is going to be interesting. The next one because. I get involved and I've actually put on the list a couple of albums that I'm on, not because I think they're the greatest albums of all time, but it'll allow me to talk from my inner perspective of being part of the prog world, which is what you're going to get on the next video, which is, what is it, part six of this huge history of progressive rock in, in 60 albums. So I hope you're enjoying it so far. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, I think I will finish there. And I'll see you on the next one. If you like this, then like it and subscribe. If you want to hear more and be, hear about the next video coming out, then go and press the uh, the notifi notification bell. Um, it's absolutely freezing in here. All right, absolutely. I'm, I've got about 15 layers on, and I don't know. Can you see? I'm breathing out steam here. I'm suffering for my art. And I think, you know, I was going to talk a little bit longer and I looked at the time and thought, oh, we've only done 21 minutes on this one. We've, we've, done, we've done 30 minutes on the other ones. And the reason is because I'm so absolutely freezing cold. On the last video, I put the heater on and I'm, I may have to go and put this on. It's, uh, and it's like, uh, I'm filming this, uh, what date is it today? 10th of December. By the time this one comes out, we're going to be pretty close to Christmas, I would have thought. And so, um, who knows? what the weather will be like. I don't want to really dwell on the weather, but I do have to, you know, um, bring up the fact that I'm absolutely freezing cold. But the funny thing is, is that, um, you know, this sort of mirrors where we're at in our history of progressive rock. I think um, the original ideas by this point that King Crimson and Genesis and Yes pioneered they have become part of establishment, but it's a very esoteric establishment. And it's something that I might talk about here. Most of the albums on this list are not from what I think most prog fans would call the progressive rock world. I'm going to try and explain this here. I think I need to explain what I'm talking about a little bit more detail. So if I go... We just got, we've got up to 1988. So if I go the, to the Prog Archives website, which is a fantastic website, and I put in 1998, we will see that something's happened at this point in time. So I'm just going to put 1998 in, and it will pull up the albums which Prog fans and critics believe. Now I'm going to do 1999 because that's where we're up to. And what album did I add? Did, did, Dillinger Escape Plan for 1999. That's the last one. But when I go to Prog Archives, we have... The list is here. Right. Metropolis Part 2, Scenes of a Memory by Dream Theatre. That is the highest rating Prog album from 1999 on the Prog Archives website. Why didn't you put that in, Andy? Why did you not put that in? Well, I think I've established that prog metal's there. Um, and we've also got Still Life by o Opeth, another prog metal app. So prog metal is there, and it's championing it. It's, it's, it's part of the prog world. But then we have Anathema, Prozant, Sigur Ross, Liquid Texture Experiment, Solaris, Anecdoten, Porcupine Tree, Sinker Dust, The Flower Kings, Nexus, Tempano, right? There's, there are just literally thousands of prog bands by this point, and I don't know them at all, right? And I'm sure there's prog fans that go, oh, that's a great album, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
what we've got here is we now have an industry and it's, it's, it's happened because the music industry is changing and people are able to self-release. And so, um, and in that there is some ex ex incredible albums uh, and now we have Bandcamp and we can go on Bandcamp and put prog in and we'll find a never-ending supply of prog uh, bands. Some of them pushing the envelope and being as progressive as all the most progressive bands and some of them just playing it safe and doing the cliched version of what we think prog should be and that's what's going on there's a whole there's a whole dearth of them i have used the prog archive site to come up with those but for me if i'm going to choose between um scenes from memory by dream theater or diligent escape plan the new thing that's emerged at this point by 1999 is this new math rock progressive metal so that's what i'm trying to do i'm still trying up with this list to just point at these new things that's coming in so i discussed dream theater in 1989 where their first album came out and i and i mentioned them and they're on their list and i think it's at that point especially images and words when that album comes which is sort of 92 is it i think that's where that they're own they're they're at their innovative peak commercially and artistically they're probably at their peak with scenes of a memory anyway that's um, where I'm coming from with this list. And as we get into the next few decades, we are literally wading through thousands and thousands of progressive rock bands. Thousands of them are all sounding, all sounding the same and all peddling the same old cliches. Uh, well, let's see where we get that. And I'm going to try and represent that with some of the best of that on that. But yeah, check out the next video. It's coming up soon. Like this one and all that bit. And I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching.